If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of the Mind Pump. Uh, for the first 42 minutes, we don't talk a lot about fitness, but we do have fun. It's our introductory portion of this episode. Then we get into the fitness stuff, but here's what we talked about in that first 42 minutes. We started out by talking about aging. Ah, oh, the beauty of aging. Yeah. All the cracks of the we joints. We love it. The gray All pubes. new hairs and weird places. It's How weird. Young Doug looks. That's, that's right. Then we talked about influencer marketing. Uh, a lot of companies are realizing that influencers are, are not all influential. Got to pick the right ones. We talked about how exercise is more important than diet to maintain weight loss. It's true. A study said so. So there. Yeah. Uh, I talked about my deadlift workout. It was epic. Uh, we talked about PRX. That is the equipment manufacturer that makes a cre- incredible home gym equipment. Justin's entire home gym has been constructed using PRX equipment. I rant and rave about it all the time. They've got the, all those awesome racks that fold into the wall and take up almost no space. Anyway, we are sponsored by PRX. So here's what you do. Go to prxperformance.com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump for 5% off and a free MAPS Prime program with the purchase of over $500. And then Adam talks about Katrina's pregnant brain. Then we get into the fitness portion of this episode. Here's the fitness questions. The first one was, what movements do we lean towards on the days when we only have enough time for a quick gym session? We give you our favorite quickies in that part of this episode. Ooh. Next question, uh, if dosed properly with a legitimate post-cycle, can you keep the gains you make with anabolic steroids? In other words, is there a way to make those gains permanent? Mm. Next question, uh, during my last visit to Red Dot Fitness, I did some sales training for the trainers. This person wants to know what piece of information provided them the greatest impact. So we talk a little bit about effective communicating for trainers because at the end of the day, trainers, your ability to communicate will dictate your client's success. And of Get course, good at it, trainers. Your success as well. And the final question, what's one thing that we firmly believe to be true that everybody else thinks is hogwash? We, we tell ghost stories, <laughs> conspiracies. Yeah. It gets real cool. It in that gets part of this weird and fun. Also, guys, it's going to get crazy. People have been asking for this. The program with the most demand is 50% off. I'm talking about MAPS Split. No. This is the body part split program that is programmed properly the way that MAPS knows how. This is a bodybuilder bikini competitor type program. It is advanced. There's a lot of volume. You do train body parts at a time, so you do get to go to the gym and work two or three body parts at a time. It's awesome, and it's half off. It's 50% off. Here's what you do. That's crazy. Here's what you do. Go to mapssplit.com. Remember, there's a double S in the middle, so it's M-A-P-S-S-P-L-I-T.com, and use the code SPLIT50, S-P-L-I-T-5-0, no space, for that 50% off discount. Go do it now. I can promise you this program will not be on sale for very long. Again, map split, 50% off. Go to mapsplit.com. Use the code SPLIT50. Dude, you know what I watched again last night? What? Unsolved. So good, right? The Biggie two. How far, how far in are you? Two second episode. Damn, you're slow. But here's... I'm not going to... I don't binge watch TV, Adam. <laughs> you're not going to be able to soon either. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Pretty soon, my boy. I can't wait for all these things that people tell me I'm not going to be doing because I'm a father now. I can't wait. No, He's gonna, no, you, can, you can wait. Yeah, Katrina's going to get me. mad. She's like, why are you watching TV all day? Because I'm not going to change anything at all. Baby's like, Meh, in the background. Yeah. I got to finish the series. No, uh, I watched it. It's really good. The dude that plays the lead investigator in 2006, the year 2006. Mm-hmm. What's his name? He uh, He's either married or he used to be married to Fergie. From the Black Eyed Peas? Yes, yes, that guy. Oh, I don't yeah. know his name. Handsome but I, dude, right? Yeah. He's got the fucking, the the the, the gray hair, dude. The, what is uh, it? Yeah. Yeah, the dude. S- silver fox in it. Yeah, dude. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, because part, because, you know, I, I yeah, see him obviously. Yeah, guys, let's do this. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I see him and I'm like, that's what I look like. I don't. Nah. But that's what I, <laughs> that's what I want to. You know <laughs> I told my girl, I'm like, my hair is like that, right? She's like, kind of. Yeah, I'm like, mine's almost turning chrome. 
Yeah. <laughs> like, like every time I go to the barber, like he uncovers more layers of this gray. Mm. You know, it's like more shiny now, but it's it's almost I don't know. It's it's almost changes it, like from a distance, like kind of blonde, but it's like no, it's silver. You're gonna be you're gonna be like uh, what's his name? You'll be Martin? white by yeah. the time. <laughs> <I know. laughs> really I'll be funky. like Doc from Back <laughs> to the Future. Yeah. Be like ah! like just look, <laughs> you know, frazzled and fucking. You know, it's old. It's 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 handsome. At least that's what I've been told. Yeah, I'm gonna go with that. So my mom says. Yeah, I'm to gonna me. go with that. You say your mom and your girlfriend yeah, tell you. My that. mom yeah. tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, moms can't be believed with that, can they? No, ever. No, I, <laughs> I see old pictures of myself when I was a kid, and I was like, "Mom, you told me I was look good here with the spiked hair and the spiked bangs going downwards. You lied to me." <laughs> She's like, "No, you're handsome." Yeah. You're my boy. You're a sweetie. Are you getting grays anywhere else? Like your eyebrows don't look yeah, like Yeah, man. My eyebrows. Um, Are they? Yeah. Like little like little spurts of I, I pluck them as much as I can see them because that's like, you know, I, that's unacceptable. Mm. Yeah. that That's unacceptable. The beard thing, like it's starting to Do you really have as much in. on me as I do on my beard? Mm, no. I think you got me there. You got me on the top. I got uh, you on yeah, the bottom. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Wow. A- Adam, you don't have <laughs> a, I don't see any grays anywhere on you. Oh yes, I on do. On your face too? Yeah, definitely. Where? My beard, my beard has them, and then soda, and I have them on the on my sides right now. A little bit. Yeah, just like little little speckles. Yeah. I mean, I guess you get. I mean, if they get the thinning thing, you get a little lucky on the gray. Thing, Is that I guess. what happens? Do gray yeah, maybe. do gray hairs fall out? More likely to fall out. You know what I'm saying? I don't mm. know. You know, I don't know. That's a weird theory. Yeah, that is a weird theory. <laughs> <laughs> Doug they doesn't have gave a, up. Doug, you don't have a single gray, but I have a, I have a sneaking suspicion that that's artificial. <laughs> Your suspicions have been confirmed. <laughs> yeah. How gray would you be had you not, if you didn't put the color? Pretty gray, actually. No, what? You wouldn't be as gray as him. Uh, probably. I think he's. You very think so? Gray. That would look well, interesting. Well, I, you know, I used to have gray hairs that I showed uh, proudly, but then my hair stylist, she said, you know, I can get rid of that. I said okay. Close I think it, I think it was a smart move because you're at a point now. I it's it's any day now. Maybe I got you like a little bit right now, but real soon here you will look the youngest, the fittest, and the healthiest. It's true. Know. Yeah, this is. I hope that's not true. Our new. Yes. Our, <laughs> <laughs> we have a company to run here. Yeah. yeah well, a fitness. Our one. youthful. Yeah. Why do you think wisdom. Why do you think we're trying to sprint so hard? Yeah. Yeah, I got like five years max. <laughs> yeah. I no. We looked at. The, we looked we at. The, squeeze this thing. The picture on the new website of all of us. Uh, new website looks great, by the way. But the picture of all of us. And I'm looking at them all, and I'm like, yep, Doug looks the healthiest, definitely. Definitely yeah. looks like the, the picture of uh, what we talk about. Yeah, We're and, and per- the youngest. I mean, real soon here, people would guess him to be the youngest. Probably. Yeah. yeah right. I mean, you've already, already you've looked the oldest since you were 20. You've mm-hmm. said that for a long time. I was born I was yeah. born with teeth and everything. I was old already. Yeah. <laughs> I came out. He's like a spectacle. Like, oh, you gave birth yes. to But I, I already feel like Justin and I are creeping on him. Like, he's he's. I think we look like we could all be about the same age, and real yeah. soon here, we'll probably look older than Maybe. Doug. Maybe. Yeah, and yet I'm still dressed like I'm in junior high. Yeah. yeah. You don't yeah. really, do you? Uh, you know, the I, I showed a picture on my Instagram, like it was literally the same outfit it was, when I was in junior high. Really? <laughs> it tripped me out because it was the same exact fly, like the same pattern, like I had a hat on, like it was very much the same exact yeah, outfit. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm slowly becoming a believer in, in both yours and Sal's strategy there of just not changing. Oh. Because oh. Just, you, just, you just go all the way. It makes yes. it back, you know? I love it. It'll come around. <laughs> You know what I mean? You like know, fashion will come find us. If I didn't have to stay on the mic, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to hug you right now, Adam. Uh, yeah. It's all happens, dude. All this shit. Like we were, uh, we were, I was going for a walk with my girl yesterday, and a car was driving. I don't know, thirty-five miles an hour, but it, I was enraged. You know what I'm saying? This is all old shit. This is stuff that starts to happen when you get older. Mm. You drove by, and I was like, Fuck! "See, now I'm the opposite with that. Like I, as I've gotten older, I've gotten more of a calm." I'm a calm driver. So some now. dude drive? No, not not me driving. I'm talking about I was walking and someone's driving through the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. I thought you meant you were getting all like road rage. I'm no, like, no, no, no. Like when I was younger, I way more speeding tickets. Yeah, that for way sure. more road rage shit. Like now I'm just kind of like, eh. You yeah, know what, what's it that that one band that sings a uh, teenager scare the living shit out of me? I was like, that makes so much sense to me now. It does now. <laughs> yeah, like they they are maniacs, like driving around and, and like you're gonna hit something. Well, what the, the the real crazy part is, as your kids get older, Justin, you'll start to remember when you were their age, and then remember the shit that you used to right. think about, talk about, and do at their age. And then you get horrified. 
you're horrified yeah. because <laughs> I'm looking at my kid who's, you know, my boy's about to go to uh, chemo- my chemical romance. Oh, my, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I'm about to, uh, my son, my boy's about to go to high school, right? And so I'm seeing these kids in high school. And I'm like, I don't remember high school kids. I When I was in high school, I don't feel like we all were that young. But, of course, we're the same age. And I'm looking at them. Right, don't, don't they look innocent? They look like. But you know you weren't innocent. They look like oh, babies. yeah. You know what's swimming around in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're little babies, you know oh, what I'm saying? Man. Yeah. And I'm like, Whoa. but they're not. No, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, oh, yeah, they got grown up ideas now. Terrible, yeah, like, terrible just ideas. A rush of grown up ideas. <laughs> oh God like, forbid! No. That's why I, I get afraid with these phones with the uh, capability to send pictures and fucking. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, FaceTime. Oh my God! You know, can let's be honest. Let's just all be straight up here. Hmm. What would you have done at 14, 15 years old with FaceTime? Yeah. yeah. No, 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 I know. Bad things. <laughs> yeah. I know I know what the fuck I would be doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not good things. So speaking of that, I didn't you have kids that are closer to like are your kids at all into the Instagram thing? Are they like getting into the like the influencers and are they do they do they care about being Lots of people yeah, following, like does following that, some person no. that they, you know, do they, they don't spend time on Instagram really. No, we we they're not allowed yet to really go on there. But my son just started listening to podcasts. Wait, 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 wait. Your kids, your son's about to go in high school, and and you and he doesn't have an Instagram yet. No, but he'll probably have one soon. I'm assuming. Or he, he, he hasn't even expressed any interest. To be or he's probably he's a ghost he, account. Yes, yeah. I was gonna say well, he's probably like Enzo, where he has one and you. Well, don't he's know. not. He he hasn't expressed any interest. And to be quite honest, my son's interests are yeah, but wait a second, fucking bro. gaming with his friends. He who, could yeah. give a shit. Who about. you don't express interest to your parents about shit that they tell you they don't want you to do. It's not like when my parents said drugs are bad. I'm like, hey, I'm thinking about drugs. I'm gonna go yeah. ask my dad. Well. We haven't even had a. We, we to be honest with you, we haven't even had a conversation where that's been I, expressed. Like, you haven't asked, like it, not really. It hasn't mm. come up. I, there's no conversation that I hear him and his friends bringing up Instagram. Mm. They're interested in gaming, and mm-hmm. that's pretty much it. You like, guys, know, you guys know how rapid the influencer, you know, industry is is growing. It's oh, a, you're you're mentioning that to me this morning. Like, what's an, the stats? It's an eighty-one billion dollar space right now. Oh my well, god! In, in and that's nothing compared Inf- to where it's going to be. Well, they project it to be a hundred and one by next year. A hundred and one billion dollar space. Wow! From eighty to a hundred and one. Yes. So it's going to grow that much in that short period of time. Are yes. consumers really like like banking their buying decisions off of these people they're following? Well, so like, this is this is what we saw happen. Okay, so like five years ago. Uh, companies were weren't even savvy to this yet, and like just five years ago. Five years ago, it was people were starting to to really flood in and get some sort of influence, get some sort of power. Then you start now. Now all companies are pretty savvy to, or privy to this. Most of them know that. Oh wow, there's some value to us having these people that have a million followers post about our hotel or post about whatever our business, and we can make some good money off of it. And the 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 bar- uh, barrier to entry as far as marketing and advertising is very low. You just find this influencer, mm-hmm. you pay them this x amount of dollars. It's a lot less than you pay for a commercial on TV. And so companies are are now in the in the last five years getting on board and figuring this out. But what we're seeing right now that's happening is it's beginning to change. In fact, I was just reading this article on a hotel resort called banana over in like the Bahamas or some shit like that. And it's like, was a, you know, influencers paradise. It's like these little cabanas right on the, right on the ocean or what that just beautiful. Hmm. And they, they jumped on board the whole influencer marketing thing and started allowing all these, you know, you know, semi famous Instagrammers to come over, fly over there for free, just post about us. And they just weren't seeing the return from it. And so what they and they had this big backlash on Twitter and they sent that out. No more influencers. We don't give a shit about them. We don't want them. I can guess why. Well, what's happening and what companies are slowly starting to figure out, because still a lot of them don't know this, is it's just because somebody has 100,000, a million followers doesn't mean they have real influence and real power. Right. Mm -hmm. 100%. Mm -hmm. And so they're starting to figure this out that... You know, you're better off having somebody with a network of only twenty something thousand people, but that are highly engaged and highly influenced by that person they're following, than somebody who has a million followers just because they do cool cars or show their ass or, and like it's just purely entertainment or they're 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 doing funny shit on their on their on their uh, Instagram. And so there's a major difference between that, and I think companies are starting to figure this out because originally they did the same mistake we'd made. Yeah. I mean, remember when we talk about it on this show, the very first thing money we ever spent on quote unquote advertising 
was somebody who had two million followers on Instagram. Gave us nothing. Gave us nothing. We got not this, even not even it was zero. And I, we spent like a thousand yeah. or two thousand dollars on this girl yeah. to post about our podcast, and we didn't feel a single. No, they just have to do their homework better because right now what they're doing is what we did, which is they're just looking at total followers. Mm-hmm. Okay, how many total followers do you have? But, but you got to do your homework a little better than that. You have to look at engagement and the kind of value that they're providing. And if the value that the influencer is providing is literally people just looking at your page, there's not a lot of value there. They're not going to want to do what you, what you say. They're not going to, you know, you're not going to change their lives in any way with anything that you're providing. Yeah. But if people are following you because you are, are you maybe gotta, an artist you, or you're providing them like value with like information mm-hmm. or stuff that people are like, oh, I value what this person has to say. I value this person's ideas. That's influence. So. Yeah, yeah, and if you have, I mean, there's a way where I could see, um, you know, big businesses making a lot of money from influencers that do have that kind of pull and reach to their audience, and they're really providing a lot of value because now it's like instead of the shotgun approach where you know a lot of big businesses they just try and just get the the word out and and get their brand out there, uh, you know, to be able to find a community that really. Um, you know, is aligned with a lot of, you know, the same types of, uh, like if your product is, is providing, you know, an answer to uh, a lot of what, you know, whatever the community is, say it's like, you know, people that are really into shoes and like you have like some product that like allows them to like connect to each other and, and you know, and, and that's, that's something that's going to gel well within like a, a shoe community that's very specific to like just Nike or something. You yeah, know? they got to well, do their homework. You, also, it has it, to be, you, you can reduce it down to like a very niche group of people and and make a lot more money if you hone in on that process. Well, it comes down to trust, right? Like you have to have, you have to have built trust with your audience first. And that that doesn't the follows don't necessarily reflect that. I follow a lot of pages. I don't yeah. trust the person who's oh yeah, posting stuff like, "Oh, this is entertaining. Oh, this is funny. Oh, that's sexy." Like, "Okay, you've got me following you for those reasons." But now that doesn't mean that I automatically trust you because of that so those same people mm-hmm. that they post hey go buy this or go check this out it doesn't mean that i'm going to go buy it because just because i follow them and- yeah and if, if i was a hotel and i was looking for influencers or a resort and i was looking for influencers to to drive people to my place i would look for people who have large followings who review hotels or people who are have travel pages that lots of people trust and hey what do you what do you think the best place to go here and what do you, those are the people that would right. probably get you some some traffic, not just you know this yeah, bikini not, model and this dude that have a million people. Great attached butts, to. yeah. That's yeah, not, that's not going to sell a lot of uh, hotel rooms. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I think we're going to also see a backlash. I, I really do because influencers, in some cases, do have some influence, and the powers that be don't necessarily like that. And so you're going to start seeing some more checks and balances, and maybe even some government regulation. I foresee that in the future. I really well, do. How? How? What do you mean? Uh, well. You're going to see cases, because this is going to happen, where an influencer says, do this thing that I said, or here's this diet that I did, or whatever. Someone's going to get hurt. That's going to be all they need to step in and say, hey, you ha- already they're making it to where if you don't put hashtag ad or somehow show someone that it's an advert uh, in your post, that you could potentially get yourself in trouble. They're now They're now saying that. So like if I were to, let's say I was aligned with a supplement company, I like their product, and uh, I'm going to promote them, and they're paying me to, to do a post of uh, of their protein bar or whatever. And so my post just shows me eating the protein bar, and I'm like, oh, I really love this protein bar. But I don't put in there like hashtag advertisement or something that shows that it's an ad. I could potentially get myself in trouble. And that's not a law yet, but I could foresee them trying to make the case for that. Yeah, it'll in be the interesting future. if they can pull that off or not. I already see some big people doing that. I see some, some because people. the word's already gotten out. That you have to be careful. Yeah, it'll and, be. and 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 I you know that's fine. I, I don't. You know, I think it's smart to do that just to kind of, you know, cover your bases type of deal. Yeah, and but make it more t- transparent too. Yeah, but at the same time, like, who fucking who cares? Yeah. You know what I mean? If you're going to look at, if somebody's going to listen to somebody and do something stupid to themselves, well, I mean, okay. You know, <laughs> that's your, that's, that's, yeah, that's the responsibility has got to be on you. Right. Yeah. That's why I kind of find it interesting how you think that's going to happen because I feel like, how can you police that? You know, I mean, yeah. you could, you could say that a minute, a million different things that you went and did some shit. And what then- they'll do is they'll police the platforms. So rather than, uh, them going after the influencers themselves, 
they'll go after the biggest platforms and they'll tell places like Instagram, hey, if you don't start taking these down or start monitoring this, if we don't see some efforts on your part, then we're going to you know, put you in front of a committee and potentially fine you guys or sue you guys or whatever. I mean, they're trying as much. You, you know, in the you know in the UK right now that uh, they're trying to. They've already the made laws. Memes, right? Yeah, like if pictures aren't. I, I'm not quite sure how it works. How they're how they're going to even enforce this? But I guess if a picture isn't giving credit to the person who initially took it or whatever, this is what their their, their strategy. That if you post it, you can get in trouble. So essentially, what they're trying to do is ban. The free sharing of images uh, and stuff like, like that, like copyright sort of. Uh, yeah, like maybe Doug can pull up how they're ban- banning memes. Yeah, huh. yeah. But I mean, I, good luck. What the how the fuck? Yeah, do you do that's that? like. Well, I know when you when you sign up for fast. Instagram or Facebook, you release that 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 uh, power. Like you, it says in yeah, their, it's theirs. Yeah, they, they actually are, are right, owning that. Right. So now. it's like, hey, you put whatever yeah. you post on here, you don't own any of this. You know thing. what it reminds me of? It reminds me of when uh, people were getting music online and sharing it for free yep and how the government stepped in and they're like no you can't you know because obviously the pressure from you know hollywood or whatever you can't do that and so they would make a few high profile cases where they would take people and find the fuck out of them Mm -hmm. but did it i mean did it stop it no No. not at all in fact it still is going on the most effective thing to to stop it was compete competition with a good sharing platform that you pay for like itunes or whatever it is interesting to see that. that's a great comparison because like uh, you you saw how that just totally upended the whole music industry and, and they're just still trying to really you know repatch it and figure out like how everybody's going to make it work so and that that happened before you know instagram and all these things came about so we have to go through quite a phase of like how we're going to figure this out what, completely in my opinion the way to beat it isn't with laws because you're not going to be able to do anything with that there's no, it's impossible it's too many people it's too free the sharing is too free um but oh there it is the eu approves controversial copyright law that could wipe out hilarious memes forever yeah that's what it was <sighs> so but yeah like how yeah, would you like with that how would you enforce this right in my opinion the best way to beat this is to outcompete it. So let's say like right now you can go online, you can get free music and you can get free movies. Right now, it's not hard to do that. A lot of people do that. But you prefer to pay for it because the quality is good, super consistent. You're not going to get any viruses. You know where it's all at and it's super easy. And that's how you're going to beat it. You're not going to beat it with, it's got to be the experience. You know what I'm saying? Like, could I get a free movie online, but is the quality going to be the same? Is it going to be this, you know, no, I'm willing to pay three bucks or four bucks for, a better experience. Mm-hmm. That's the only way I think they're going to beat it. Well, doesn't it doesn't it open it up the opportunity for somebody to be a business that does that that creates the memes and then sells that? Like it's oh, you have a membership sure. for three ninety nine, and mm-hmm. then what we do is we provide all of this, and you can use it because it's ours. We own the rights to it. Maybe mm-hmm. you know, but uh, kind of like what you just said with iTunes. Like that to me, that's when I see like what's going to happen with like Instagram is you know where we've seen what's happened with like Facebook is. I, I mean, I think it's about the money. I think it's more about the money yeah. than people. Like, it's more about that. Like, follow them. I think we're we're more we're lucky right now that we can get away with monetizing the way we do off of these platforms. I think they're sooner or later they squeeze they squeeze the businesses. Right now, it's like they're letting all these people you know go ape shit, get lots of traction, make fuck tons of money, buy all their whips, and celebrate yep. fucking being successful off of. You know, now they want their piece, right? Well, and then, it's, a, it's limited and, and, then, space. and they'll be able to, and they'll they'll have so much leverage that you can't give it up. It's yeah. just like what face like Facebook. It's the wild wild west right now with Facebook ads. I mean, everybody has moved over there. Like nobody does Google ad, or no, I shouldn't say nobody. Very few people do Google AdWords anymore because Facebook's return on it is so much so much better and it's cheaper. But what happens when you're a company who makes a hundred million dollars a year? You spend. Five hundred thousand dollars a year in Facebook advertising right now, and it returns you, you know, millions of dollars. What do you do when they decide to double that or triple that? You can't stop. Mm-mm. You know, as long as it's re- if it's it's returning you what you're spending, you're doing it. If you're a business, it's like they just squeeze the fuck out. Well, everybody. the reason why they'll squeeze it isn't just because they they're going to squeeze it. It's, they'll squeeze it because there's limited space, limited you know, billboard space, if you will. So here you are, you're a, a, a online company, your ten million dollar company. You know, large, but not even close to being considered big in the big business world. And then you have big companies like Sony and, you know, Hollywood and whatever moving in and saying, hey, we want to buy shit tons of space on Facebook. Now the price just went up. Now you're competing with big companies that have huge, huge budgets. That's when it's going to get crazy. That's when it's going to be hard for every, you know, average person to start a business and do these types of ads. 
So uh, it'll be interesting. Right now is a great time to get in. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, like definitely. get your foot holding now because I think in five to – what do you guys think? Five to ten years is when it's going to get crazy? It's happening so fast. You know, even five years ago, Facebook ads was – you think it's the Wild West now. Yeah. Back when Doug and I went to the these internet marketing uh, conventions, which was probably six years ago, that was the Wild West. Mm. That was crazy. Those guys were doing stupid ads or whatever and getting massive returns, and it was super easy. And then all of a sudden, Facebook started cracking down on what you could and couldn't say and how you could do the ads. And all Well, that it's almost inevitable that it'll move because it, it always does, right? I mean, if it was email marketing, then it was Google, then it's Facebook. It's so, I mean, I think Instagram is the next one that everybody is, that it, they're going to get better and better mm. about how we get advertised to on that. I mean, you're already seeing more and more ads pop up in your Instagram feed. So, you know, I think they're going to- Does gonna, Twitter sell yeah, ads? I can see that. Um, I don't know if- yeah, I'm sure Twitter has to. They have to, right? Yeah, I would. I would think so. I mean, I'm not on there very often, so yeah, I don't know how that works. Mm, interesting. So, read a study uh, yesterday that that showed that exercise is more important than diet when it comes to maintaining weight loss. So they took uh, it, was a, it was a large study that they did, and they looked at individuals who lost a lot of weight, and they looked at the people who were successful at keeping it off and they compared and they controlled and they looked at, okay, these, this group over here is constantly calorie restricting. That's like one of the, that's the main way that they're keeping their weight off, weight off. This group over here is exercising a lot and is uh, being very active. And the group that was active, believe it or not, was far more successful at maintaining their weight loss. And I think it has to do with just the way the body adapts. Yeah, I mean, you stay restricted with calories long enough. Yeah, well, where you know, where do you go? Because well, when your body adapts to like lowered, you, you know, restricted calories, there's not really, you know, any further you can go to where your body's now in starvation mode and is trying to make sure it's, to preserve. It's not just that when we when we lift weights. You're you're also making sure that some of the those additional calories you may consume are being partitioned over into building muscle. Mm -hmm. So it's I mean it's one of my favorite things to do with a client is, you know, is to put them in a surplus but really start to ramp up the volume and training because it's like, yeah, I know you're eating more calories than you've ever ate and that might scare you like you're going to put on a bunch of body fat. But no, if we are if we are programmed right, if we're lifting correctly, and I know that I'm increasing the training volume in you. A majority of those good calories are going to go to building muscle. You're not going to put body fat on. Very you, minimal yeah. at all. You want to have a faster metabolism. and you know, this. So it's consistent with the same study. They had this longitudinal study on the Biggest Loser contestants. And the ones that were consistently physically active were far more likely to keep the weight off than the ones that weren't. Even though they were all looking and restricting you know, calories. Exercise makes a big fucking difference when it comes to uh, to, to weight gain. Yeah, and weight you have loss to have that for it to be sustainable. Well, give you the faster metabolism. Of course, there's other aspects here that I think they're not controlling for, right? Like if you exercise regularly, you're healthier and you feel better. You're probably going to make better decisions overall right. anyway, yeah. right? It makes that big of a difference. And I think – I know we're talking about this in the context of weight loss because that seems to be the most important thing that – people look at. But when it comes to just overall well-being, um, exercise plays one of the biggest roles. And some many studies show that it may even play the biggest role in just long-term well-being and health. It's just how active are you? How much do you exercise? Do you do resistance training? Do you walk a lot? Do you spend time outside? We definitely were not we definitely did not evolve to be uh, just as sedentary as we as we currently are. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it makes that big of a difference. Anyway, yeah. I did a. Um, I'm freaking hammered right now. I did a, a deadlift workout the <laughs> oh, other day. I you drank a lot. Or no, yeah, yeah, at nine a.m. <laughs> like, wow. I like to get smashed. In That's the usually my verb for this. It. Yes, I just sober I, up I as the day lot. goes along. Yeah. Yesterday's workout or today's workout? No, I did it yesterday, and I haven't done high rep deadlifts. Well, high rep is ten for me in a long time. So I did, and I was short on time. I woke up a little late in uh, in the morning, so I wanted to lift. And so I'm like, shit, I only have 45 minutes instead of my normal hour. So I did a short rest too on top of it. But I did 315 and I did uh, sets of 10 reps, touch and go, with like 45 second rest in between. Holy shit, man. My mid-back is fucking gone. It's toast. <laughs> yeah. Like, when's the last time you did high rep deadlifts? <sighs> Not in a long time. I've dude. done that more recent than I've done really heavy. Really? Mm-hmm. 
where you yeah. just just go for it. Do you yeah. get your rhomboids just get smashed yeah, right no, between it, your shoulder blades? It's actually I've I've actually felt it's not a lift that I traditionally was doing really light like that. Uh, I was up in fifteen rep range, so I've been doing like two twenty five for fifteen, and that's been kind of the workout for my deadlift. I haven't gone over shit. I don't think I've gone over three fifteen in in deadlifting in quite some time. Because I, my goals are different right now. I'm not trying sure. to be this massive meatball muscle guy anymore. So trying to build my endurance, trying, uh, and so my weightlifting is reflecting that. Same thing with squats. Like, it's more rare now to catch me squatting really heavy or deadlifting really heavy than in, in the other way. And I, here's the thing about that, man. And this was one of the things I shared with you guys when I went through that process of like really trying to chase the the PRs uh, with you a couple of years ago. I mean, I, I feel better right now than I have probably in a very, very long time. Oh, I mean, he- heavy weight, heavy weight, and constantly pushing heavy weight is high, high risk. Oh, yeah. Yeah, high risk. It, adds, it pressures the hinges. I mean, anything that could sort of, uh, you know, be exposed and, and create mm-hmm. a problem for you that like at high weight, uh, it's going to expose that and you're going to feel that. I noticed it, it, it like my mobility is like crazy now. Like I, I've, yeah. I've got some of the, I went from being somebody who was not mobile whatsoever to, I mean, out of my, for anybody that's a friend of mine, like I don't have anybody who's more mobile than I am now. Mm. And I'm six foot fucking three, dude. Like, yeah. and a lot of that, when I was lifting really heavy was just kind of hindering that. I was always, I felt inflamed a lot, uh, achy joints a lot. It was really tough to also try and work on being this hyper mobile guy. This is where the myth of uh, weight training be bad for the joints comes from. It's it's it comes from uh, people who constantly test right. their like really heavy heavy weights, and so then people say because I mean let's be honest, you're doing 15 reps with 225 pounds. You're squatting with probably 220 to 275 pounds. It's not like you're doing body weight stuff and you're going light, yeah, you're yeah. still resistance training. Right, right. You're just not pushing the PR your stuff. heavy, right, heavy Right, right. I'm not yeah. doing 400 pounds. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I'm not, which it, really easy for me to get in the ego lifting like that because it, mm-hmm. you, you, it's fun. All, yeah, it feels fucking good to rip 400 something pounds off the ground or squat that, you know, out of a hole. Like, that's, there's something very, I don't know if it's a manly thing that makes me feel that way or what it is. But it's definitely ego lifting, and I can get I'm, I'm just as guilty as anybody. I can get caught up in that. And since my goal has been all about this mobility and swimming and rowing, and I've been more like health focused, I'm not I'm not tracking to build a bunch of muscle on my body. Just right feel now. good. Yeah, I just want to feel good right now. Which I also know me. Eventually, I'll get bored of that too, and then I'll probably chase some people. Try pe- and press it. Yeah, then yeah. I'll try and press it again. I mean, that to me that this is the way that. For, this is what's kept me in fitness for over 15 plus years is that I love that. I love that I have the control of the ability to say, hey, this is what I'm going to work on for a while. And it, get, it, it, it breaks up the monotony of training so much. If you're always trying to look a certain way or you're always trying to get stronger or you're always kind of going after the same thing all the time, it's really one – it tends to lead down a bad path where eventually injury potentially happens or it just gets flat out fucking boring or get discouraging because the body it does adapt and get very efficient no matter what uh, we're if you if you play yeah. if you're not in the gym to work out but rather you're in there to play and enjoy what you're doing mm-hmm. you're probably more likely to do it forever dude that's how I've been feeling too I mean mine's been more power based in terms of like uh, really like the speed and acceleration of uh, pushing weights but also like you know very much considering the control and uh, you know it hasn't been heavy weights like when you're when you're dealing with power you have to go fast you have to go fast and so like that's been my entire goal is to um, you know just get that sort of snap again mm-hmm. and like feel that because for me that's always where I felt like I just feel the, the the best like I feel like I can do anything I can move any direction I can have that sort of power access that I want uh, and it's been fun man there's different techniques like so you've been doing like multiple reps like for me like I've been banding um, y- you know like deadlifts and so I've been doing that where now my focus is on you know that concentric first bit speed yeah. speed yeah. And, and I'm just trying to whew, get that thing up there and uh, you do know, you have bumper plates at home I do have bumper plates and so are they now did you buy your plates from PRX too or was it just the, the cage and I, yeah I bought so you, I bought the plates from PRX I bought the 
racks from PRX. I bought the, you know, how I, I basically organize my weights on the wall as well. So I got the wall mounted one. So everything lives on the wall. And I could fold it out. It's so great because I just... Um, How far does it all uh, stick out from the wall when you fold in the cage? you got the weights because they're sticking out of the wall, right? Yeah, maybe like, I want to say like a foot. That's it? No, no, that's you just did about two feet in your hand. Is so that... Yeah. yeah, yeah so, fucking... But yeah, it's probably like this. Cause there's, really? Think about that's like... That's freaking small though. That's think not about two 245-pound like bumper plates. Like That's like, it? Yeah. Like, wow. And may, I might be able to stack like another... Uh, like a twenty-five, maybe, but Holy that's it. Holy shit, that takes up zero space. It's not. It's not anything. So yeah, and, and you can open the door like. So I, I and I'm limited on space. I don't have a garage. Like I don't have anything that's like, um, you know, like a, an obvious place to put a gym. And so this was like an ex, extra room where I kind of just use it for storage. Now, when you fold out the the cage, because you, I mean, you're strong squatter. Even when you go light, three fifteen. When mm-hmm. you're pulling out the the cage, uh, you know, because it folds in, right? So you pull it out. Mm-hmm. It, it hits the ground. How yeah. how like is it solid? Does it feel like like not a big deal, or does it feel like is it not as solid as a cage? Yeah. So basically, so it has these uh, hydraulic um, sort of hinges to it. So w- when you let it down, it doesn't like like slam onto the ground or anything. Really, it's kind of like just suspended a bit. But when you put the weight on top of it, then it's like really secure. Oh wow! So that being so, when I go, I can li- literally lift each one of those racks up with one hand and just push it back into the wall when I'm done. So it's, it's probably because it's hitting the ground and connected to the wall. It probably feels more stable than a regular, yeah, like, free well, cage. Right? Yeah, it's it, it it's very secure. So I know that was like a concern, but yeah, if you get it right and you you mount it right, so you have it on the studs, like it's not going anywhere, dude. Like I could I could load that thing with probably you know five hundred, but I won't obviously because mm. I'm not that strong. But yeah, mm. like it, it would feel curls, that secure. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I've been I've been going uh, to club sport again and working out, and um, what I've been doing when I go because I have my garage gym, which is all free weights. Yeah, and then club sport is obviously a normal gym, and so what I've been doing when I go there is straight bodybuilding machine, you know, free weights, but a lot of machine type pumping type workouts. And there's a lot of benefit to doing those too every once in a while. Like it's easy on the joints. Mm -hmm. I get a really, really good pump. Um, And there's certain machines that are, they have this one hoist pull down machine that I would have never thought would have felt as good as it The one that lifts your butt up when you also, yeah. I would have never thought it would have felt as good as it did. You know, you know why I think that is, is, you, you know, we talk about the cue on a lap pull down where we talk about lift your chest sure. up to the bar. You know, it's lifting your butt and lifting your torso up in the direction as you're pulling down. I think it just helps. There's something. Helps exaggerate. You up, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's part of that, because I was thinking about that, and I'm like, I wonder, because why would they do that? Just fucking have the arms move. And I'm thinking, I wonder if that, you know, psychologically causes more of a, because our, we're so, our bodies, we, we, we're probably more primed to move our bodies than we are to move objects. Uh, in terms of you know how we evolved, so I, I was wondering if there was a psychological cue there that was helping me connect more. But I'm pretty good at, at connecting to what I need to. I think it might be part of that, Adam. And I also think the angle for my body just seems really good. Like I'm doing it, I'm like, holy shit! I never knew a machine. Well, could the do. it's also on a it's on a it's on a rotating axis, so yeah. it's not like it it should be for everybody's. But that's what's great about that machine too. Like that, I love. That's one of my favorite hoist machines that they've made. Because even if you're a tall, so there's one thing about being about a tall, lanky guy like me. Machines sometimes are like hit and miss. Mm-hmm. You're roll, too tall for them. Huh? Yeah, it's a roll of dice if it's going to fit my body just right. I normally have to kind of like get in differently and, and kind of create my own position in there to to feel it the way I want to. But some of those machines and that hoist one you're talking about, I knew right away when you said it because it is. It's one of my mm-hmm. favorite, and that's because where you grab it. On the handle, it's on an axis. Sure. So then if it doesn't matter how tall or long your arms are, it sh- should fit you. And then that part where the seat lifts, the seat elevates as you pull up, I feel like it just promotes that retracting the shoulders and lifting the chest up as you come down. Now, of course, it helps when you understand the mechanics like you do really well. So I think it just helps exaggerate that so much. It's, it is one of my favorite machines. Yeah, I really make. feel it. And then I hadn't done leg press in, I don't know, 15 years, maybe 10 years. <laughs> 
And so I can never do leg press. Right? Has it really been that long? I never do it. You know, when I was a kid, I would do it every once I, in a while. I really do like single leg leg press. I know we shit on it for a long time because. Well, uh, that was your thing. You used to talk about it all the time. I love yeah. single leg leg press. Well, so I did the, just double leg and I've been, you know, kind of doing it a little bit and just feeling how it feels different than other, you know, leg exercises. I, I don't think it's uh, in the same category as squats. Um, but because I never do it, I'm sure I'll gain some benefit. So I did a little of that. And mm-hmm. it's funny, man. I'm like, God, if anybody was watching me right now and knew that I was... Mind pump? Yeah, they'd be like, oh, <laughs> you liar. Doing? Yeah, yeah. You're using all the yeah. machines, you know? <laughs> but such a phony. It's funny because I feel the same way now whenever we do something that's like... like Even the way I'm, like, I'm swimming or doing like cardio type exercise right now, I'm always like looking over my shoulder. Like, there's, <laughs> there's, there's somebody that's thinking I'm a liar. Like I don't ever do cardio. It's like, no, it's not that I don't ever do. Yeah, it's funny. It's true that a lot of the stuff that we talk about on the show i think we come from a uh i think the the point that we try and make is that we we understand the audience we understand a majority of people getting into fitness and so we're trying to steer them in the right direction not to say you could never do these things or we would never do those things it's like well there's just on the the hierarchy of stuff that you should really put your energy and focus on. Most people aren't doing. Right, Most yeah. people are not squatting. Most people you'll never see do a sissy squat. Most people don't deadlift enough. Like these are things that like you got keep practicing that. Keep, now that's not to say if you're somebody listening and you do all those things all the time really well that hey going over and doing the leg press or doing the machines or hopping on some cardio. There's not a lot of great hey, health man, benefits around all. I'm a fitness connoisseur and I love. Uh, I love fitness. I love resistance training in particular, and there's so many different ways to do it. Yeah. And I like to do it and have fun. I like to go to the gym, and I've been doing this shit for 20-something years. Yeah, you better believe yeah, I'm going to go. You got to keep it fresh, man. Yeah, so I'm having a good time going in and trying. I even did some of the uh, uh, abductor machine, the the good girl, bad girl. Whoa, machine. hey. You know? And you know why I did I that? Want that's I want a video. Now, that's almost a waste yeah. of time. It's actually, <laughs> you know what's funny? Most of the time it is, but you know what I noticed with myself? So I, I was fooling around, and I'm looking at the machine, and I like to see the way machines are designed. So I get in there, and, I, and I'm and i messing with it, and then I realize how terrible my abduction is, or at least I mean, end ranges of motion. So I'm like, huh. Yeah. So I get in there, I put a little bit of weight, and I'm just coming out and pushing out as far as I can. Man, it made my, fit, did my you, hips uh, feel real stable. Did you wear the spandex and the, the shorts, yeah, and or the, did and you the, expose the trouser trap? And, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, everybody saw everything. Yeah, okay. Did you hover your butt off the seat, too? To do that, to yeah. <laughs> the butt building. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that yeah, one. I've yeah. seen that I was one. holding yeah, on to the top. And yeah. I, was, <laughs> I had Jessica <laughs> film me for the back. Pulse, yeah. pulse, Can pulse. you post this to my Instagram, please? <laughs> I, love the, I love the pulsing yeah. exercise. Speaking of girls, how's your how's your girl? Oh, my God. So the smart. So since we had our interview, which hasn't gone live yet, um, I committed to getting up early, right? I told you guys I'm just not a morning person. Yeah. So this morning was like uh, one of the first mornings that I got. And I told Katrina because she gets up early every morning. She's a 5 a.m. riser because she her construction stuff is super early, right? And uh, I told her before we went to bed, I said, hey, when you get up, I want to get up with you. You know, uh, when you go downstairs, because she normally goes downstairs and she normally starts the coffee for me. So when I wake up, the coffee's already made. I love that. And so I told her, I said, hey, if, when you get up and you go downstairs, like, you know, don't forget about me. I want to come down and have coffee with you and, and we'll have breakfast. I'll read read my morning coffee or my morning brew newsletter and my hustle newsletter and we can hang out in the morning. So we did that this morning. It was great. Uh, and one of the things that she asked for me is she's like, hey, could you do me a favor and drop off all these these T-shirts that Doug needed over at the UPS thing or whatever? And I'm like, yeah, I could I could do that. And she she leaves to work first. And she, she, she calls me. She goes, "I fucking went to your work." I go, <laughs> I go "What?" She goes, "I have no idea why I'm here right, now. <laughs> right, right now." That pregnancy brain's I'm real, right. huh? And I'm assuming that it's just because she was for the first time in the morning. She was with me. We were talking about mind pump business and stuff like that. And so maybe mind autopilot. Pump, yeah, oh, mind pump wow. was on her mind. We were talking about the t-shirts and things like that. And so I think she just assumed to go to Mind Pump, <laughs> but she calls me and she goes, "I'm at your work right now." Oh, she goes, shit. "I have no idea why I'm here right now." That's though. hilarious. Is uh, she is funny. she does she seem happier, more tired, more sad, more? Uh, actually, her energy level has gone up quite significantly in comparison to the first trimester. First trimester, it was it was. <laughs> It was torturous for me. I mean, she was going to bed at like six o'clock and wanting me to go to bed with her. It was fucking sun's up. I'm like, I can't go to bed. Yeah. It's sun is up still. <laughs> and she would. I've never seen her do this before where she'd be like laying next to me on the couch at six o'clock in the afternoon or six o'clock in the evening and just fall asleep. Like, 
but she's not doing that anymore. She's back to like her workouts. Like we went for a nice long walk last night. Like she's starting to get into the rowing a little bit. Like so, um, her energy levels and stuff like that are really good. She and she, I haven't seen any signs of uh, morning sickness or headaches, stuff like that. All that stuff, she hacked that really early. She she pieced together like wake up, eat something before yes, you go to bed. Yes. Yeah. She realized that if she ignored that feeling of, oh, I should eat something or I want something, if she ignored that at all, like you could get away with when she didn't have a baby inside of her, no problem. She never had a problem. She could fast. She fasted all the time like I would and no, no big deal. But now with the baby, if she doesn't eat when her body, doesn't matter if it's four in the morning, when it is, if it, she wakes up and she feels a little hungry, she knows she has to go downstairs, go eat. And as long as she does that, she oh, doesn't get the headache. She doesn't get sick. You don't have like a mini fridge next to the bed. She's open it up. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. I've told her that if she wants to do that, because I used to do that. So but, yeah, she's been. It's been great, man. She's doing really good and uh, starting to feel the movement now. So she felt she woke up for the first kick the other day. So uh, I haven't felt the first like official kick yet. But she's. She says she's coming, bro. Yeah, yeah. Oh so this, yeah. That should be this next week or so. I'm excited for my little nephew. Yeah, I'm pumped. Yeah. Too. <laughs> I'm pumped. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. First question is from J Wayne90. What movements do you lean towards on days when you only have enough time for a quick gym session? That's a good question. Um, first, I think we should define quick. Like how, how fast is he talking? I'm thinking like 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. That's probably what you would consider fast workout. Yeah, because otherwise, I mean, I don't really know what, what I would do if I had like just 10, 15 minutes. Like it's just kind of mobility. Well, I've done it before. Yeah, I've, I've actually, I've, this happens a lot. There's many times, and you know what? This didn't start to happen until later in my career. I used to have this stupid attitude of all or all or nothing. Yeah. I'm either all the way in on the way I'm training and dieting and all about my workouts like or I'm off the wagon. And you know what? There's there's a lot of benefit to squatting five sets and, yeah. and nothing else. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of benefit to spending 20 minutes of just doing a Turkish get up. And then get you know, there's nothing wrong with a a a quick little session like that because you're either crunch for time or sometimes I'm just not in the mood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes and it keeps momentum too. I found like, and especially too, like uh, I've done sessions like that where I'll just squat and I'll just do that for maybe 20 minutes. But then um, I'm also then charged and motivated like later in the day. I'll just find another opportunity that's a short window where I'll just take advantage of it and do something else. So I'll do an overhead press or, you know, maybe it's split apart during my day or maybe I just got that in, but at least it's one thing that will keep carrying momentum the rest of the week. Now, now when I do choose to do this though, I most, it, I definitely don't do cable push downs, camber curl curls. Like I'm doing a, either a compound lift or compound movement. That's yeah. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm doing, I'm doing a compound movement for sure. So there has definitely been times where I've only overhead pressed. I've only squatted. I've only deadlifted. I've only bench pressed. Uh, I have only Turkish get up. I mean, there's definitely the times where I pick one of those movements, but I guess what, what dictates that for me is what I think is most neglecting. Like if I've been inconsistent, let's say with squatting, and I know I'm only going to get in and do one thing, or I'm only going to spend 10, 15 minutes in the gym while I'm going to squat, you know, or I know I've been neglecting deadlifts. I'm, I'm so I'm going to do what I think I'm, I'm, I've neglected. I just did this with bench the other day. Uh, just yeah. I've been all, I've been all row, all swimming, all back kind of guy. And I really have just kind of neglected chest exercises and bench pressing. And I'm like, you know, what? I need a good, a good chest yeah. lift. And I was in here just bench pressing. Yeah, realistically, you know, if you have, 20 minutes you can do three exercises and you can do them relatively well you could do two to three sets of each exercise short rest in between 30 seconds um, and pick three movements that kind of cover the whole body my three movements tend to be uh, squat bench press and a row or squat uh, dips and pull-ups if I really want to go fast because dips and pull-ups don't require me to set up a bar or anything mm -hmm. and I can do that and I mean I can do that in 15 minutes in fact I do that all the time and I've hit the, the the lower body. I've hit the pushing muscles of the upper body, the pulling muscles of the upper body. I get a little bit of core activation from the squat. 
I get biceps and triceps and shoulders. And you kind of hit the old, the whole body, but definitely you don't want to go in the gym unless it's one of those days where you're like not feeling that good and you only have yeah. 20 minutes. Then I'd say go do some mobility, some stretching, do some you know full range of motion type stuff. But three barbell Ooh. movements or three full body movements, psh, no yeah, problem. I completely agree. Uh, it, it's also interesting because depending on you know what your focus is, uh, you know if you've structured like your regular workouts around you know one sort of a theme, and so lately for me it's been power, and so for me like if I only get an opportunity to have you know thirty minutes even like I will just focus completely on a clean and jerk, and so I'm getting everything there. You know that that's a perfect you know skill for me to just completely hone in on, and I'm going to hit all my muscle groups. Just you know, it's a fantastic movement for that. I'll tell you what. Um, let's say you're somebody that says, okay, I can work out three days a week, and I can spend one hour three days a week. So that's a total of three hours, right? You could do that, or you could do six days a week, thirty minutes, um, or twenty minutes. What's going to give you better results? To be quite honest with you, uh, the, the frequent smaller workouts might be superior in some ways for the average person. Now, you're not going to be able to get into the workout and really hammer yourself, but that daily activity might be better for a lot of people. And schedule-wise, I've had clients like this where it's harder for them to take an hour to an hour and a half a few days a week than it is for them to do 20 minutes every day. It's easier for them to do that than, the, than you know taking that time aside. So short. I would not knock short workouts. No, I, it's this is I, I feel passionate about this because this is a mistake I think I made as, as a trainer for a very long time. I really had the attitude that if I can't get into this full routine, I would just not lift at all. And I think it's crazy. And I, I look at the amount of effort I put towards uh, training today. And, and literally, this is like right now, currently, because I'm like swimming and row guy right now. I'm like and mobility guy. I'm totally not lifting the volume compared to what I was lifting just two, three years ago is re it would take me out. No joke. It would take me probably two months of training to equate to a week's worth of, uh, of working oh, out. You're currently doing. Versus yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, and I can stay, I'm in pretty damn good shape right now. I mean, I'm, I'm relatively lean. Just not that kind of shape. Right. Yeah. So, so the, the question here or the, the, the answer to this question is really like, what are your goals? Like now, if you're trying to make moves and progress your physique and like, yeah, little short workout here and there, probably not going to give you a major bang for your buck. But man, I, I definitely wouldn't just write it off like I used to. I used to mm -hmm. totally be that guy who would write off the gym. If I can't give it, you know, a forty-five minutes to an hour minimum, I'm not even going to waste my time for ten minutes. Yeah. Like, see, see, the thing is, total different attitude. The thing now. is that modern life requires, uh, it, or at least it, it somewhat requires us to schedule blocks of time to dedicate to dedicate to activity because modern life is is quite sedentary. So yeah. we tend to block out one or two hours to do a workout a few days a week. But reality, uh in, in reality, evolutionarily speaking, we evolved not doing blocks of in, intense activity that way. The way we did was we were just kind of active Constant, all, day long. all the time. And so if you're talking about longevity and health, in my opinion, you're probably better off doing 20, you know, 10 to 20 minute workouts several times a day, yeah. every day, where in the morning I wake up and I do 15 minutes of exercise. And then maybe at lunch, I do another 10 minutes of exercise. And then maybe after dinner, I do another 15 minutes extras. And rather than doing, you know, three days a week at the gym where I'm there for two hours, that's kind of what I do every day. I would bet, I would bet money that the person who did that kind of activity, even if it all equated to the same, probably would have better health yeah. Better mobility, probably get better results. I mean, if people could afford to have that, you know, in their schedule or like, you know, revolve their work and everything else and balance around like just continuously like making efforts like that where you have like just moments throughout the day where you do these exercises, it would be way more beneficial, I would assume. It is. And and for me, I, I do some I do workouts like this all the time, by the way. So like uh were you, have you always been like that or were you like me where you, before you weren't like that? Like cause this is this is a big deal for me because it wasn't in until probably not even till us until mind pump happened no like I, before mind pump I, I was this guy who if i wasn't getting after it i'm off no it's yeah. so i first kind of understood this years ago when i had this trainer that worked for me who was uh just i would notice that in between clients he'd go out to the workout floor and he would do like 
two or three sets of an exercise. So he'd get under the bench and yep. he'd do a couple sets and then he'd go back to training his clients or he'd go out and he'd do some Grease squats. Grease in the groove. And he never, he never, I never saw him do these long workouts. Now I know he did those also, but mainly what I saw was these, these small workouts and he was strong as fuck and very, very fit. And I thought, wow, that's crazy that, you know, uh, that he does that and he looks so good. And, and so I talked to him about it and he's like, yeah, he goes, this is how I got my bench press over 400 and this is how. So I started trying some of these techniques and this is what got me some early PRs when, when, when I would lift back in those days. Fast forward when I created MAPS Anabolic, which, you know, consists of three full body workouts and the rest of the week you're doing kind of these trigger sessions. It's been, it solidified it for me. And so now to this day, I do three full workouts a week. Now I work out a lot, right? I'm obviously a fitness fanatic and this is my career, but I only do three real full workouts a week. Those are my full body workouts. Now the rest of the week, I still work out, but they consist of 15 to T- touch and go. Yeah, 15 to 30 minute. Either I'll do a circuit or I'll do just three exercises or I'll do some mobility mm-hmm. or I'll drive the sled or I'll just work on my core. And I'm kind of working on things. And when I'm really motivated and focused, those days that I don't do the full body workouts, I'm doing two or three of those during the day. And that's when I feel my absolute best. I wish I would have pieced this together as a trainer working in a commercial gym because there was many times I had this little 30-minute break between a client. Somebody's late or whatever. Yeah, someone's late. Like, I wish I would have had – I really did. I really – I looked at my workout as it had to be this intense block Mm -hmm. that I had to get after it, and I had to be in the right mental space. Uninterrupted. I I had to have food lined up afterwards. (laughs) Pre-workout, post-workout. Yeah, Yeah. it it was this whole ritual that I had had, uh, that I felt I needed to have, and the way I train right now, it's like it's so different. I mean, it's you know, mind you, we have the luxury of of working in a gym, right? So we have our own gear here. I have stuff now at my place, and so yeah, that's kind of how I train right now. It's actually more rare that I get a full hour block right now where I get after it. I'm really not training like that right now. I'm doing all these little odd these little odd exercises or one one or two exercises, and I'm on to something like today. This is literally today. I rode for 15 minutes this morning. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go do some Bulgarian split squats, and I'm going to do some dumbbell bench press. That's it. And then I'm heading over to go swim. That's my day today. You know, it's great. And I, I think I you know, I remember, you know, you might have mentioned this in terms of like how you, you, uh, you know, plan this out with your clients and you put like stickers and you have them kind of, if I'm in this area, like I'm going to be doing push-ups or if I'm in this area. So, you know, subconsciously, like I, I kind of structured around my house – like I'll put bands over like where I'm, I, you know, visit the most frequently. And then I have kettlebells over here, another place where I'm like heavy trafficking all the time. And then downstairs I have my PRX. And, uh, so there's just like opportunities where I just see something, I pick it up and I just start doing stuff. And I just, that's just how I am anyways. It's right. like, I just see something like, Oh, cool. You know, and I'm just standing there and I'm doing something. And then I just move on. And I'm sure, you know, I'm going to try and keep that up and see, you know, yeah. how much of a difference that makes. I think the key to understand, really is that some is better than nothing. So, yeah. And this was, I remember learning this in a, one of these marketing classes that Doug and I took a long time ago where they said, you know, uh, if you make this change, it might help you a little bit. And someone raised their hand like, how much is it really going to help you? And they said, more than zero. You're going to get more than nothing by doing nothing. And so if you have 10 minutes, 10 minutes of activity is better than zero minutes of activity. Yeah. So don't, it. Yeah, so don't look at the time and be like, "Oh, it's, I only have twenty minutes. It's not. It's not worth it's, it." It's not only that. I mean, that's a good analogy for marketing, but it's even more compounding with fitness because of the the benefits that you get, like endorphin wise, the energy that you uh, get. From it'll your pay heart. you back. Like just this morning to to get on the rower and only spend fifteen minutes on the rower. Like I, I could just feel the way I was. I, I moved with more pep in my you step. Think better. Oh clear, yeah, I was way more clear. I was had way more energy. Like. So I can I can feel myself the the effects of that you know even though it's something so small and little I definitely can feel myself uh, yeah you know what's interesting about that and I know that uh, anxiety is a big deal you know these days uh, and I'm sure the sedentary lifestyle is a big contributor to that uh, you know for me I know that like this this energy that's that I didn't express that day it stores up and it turns into you know things like that and so I've I've noticed that the more frequently I'm I've I've moved like it's just totally lowered that yeah maybe the message should be interrupt your day with short bouts of of movement that's probably one of the best strategies for most people for long-term health next question is from Clydesburg if dosed properly with a legitimate post cycle 
Can gains made with steroids be maintained without continuous use of steroids? Now, didn't a study Ooh. come out, Sal, this last year that I believe you shared? Didn't you share a study around this? Which that, one? That, that showed, because the, the theory used to be that you would take you could take steroids, but if you came off steroids, you lost all your gains. Mm -hmm. And I could have sworn it was you who shared a study in this last year that that they had just shown that what you you once you dependent on the length of how long you've been using versus like if it's a short amount of I don't know. I'm, well, look, so, I'm looking over at study guy yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, no, I'm throwing I that out there. No, the, no. the study wasn't specifically about steroids. The study was about um, what happens when you build muscle. And you know, so when you build muscle, your your muscle fibers uh, hypertrophy; they grow. You also may get some hyperplasia, where muscle fibers split and become new muscle fibers. Um, and when you lose muscle, there are certain aspects of the muscle that kind of doesn't go away. Uh, satellite cells, uh, for that's example, right. uh, stay uh, within the muscle, and that's why building muscle the second time around, third time around, is much faster than the first time. So theoretically, could you go on anabolic steroids, gain twenty pounds of muscle, go off? Lose the muscle, but then maintain those that that kind of muscle memory, which makes it easier to kind of inch your way back up to where you were on anabolics. I would say yes, but here's a problem. The problem is when you go off steroids, like like any drug. It's funny. I was having this conversation with um, I got a DM from someone who asked me if anabolic steroids were addictive, and I sure. said, and I said, well, anything can be addictive psychologically. Anything yeah. that you you can develop a bad relationship to can be, become addictive. And then I thought about it and I said, wait a minute. For the longest time, we've been told that steroids are not addictive in the classical sense like most drugs. I think that's bullshit because the, the definition of being a, of a physiologically addictive substance is that you go through a withdrawal period afterwards. Do you go through a withdrawal period when you go off anabolic steroids? Absolutely. Your body, when you're on these hormones, stops producing its own testosterone, stops producing its own hormones. So when you go off, there's a period of time where it takes your body to go back up to where it was normal. And sometimes that never happens. In some cases, it never happens. But if it does happen, it can take months. And so whatever gains you made when you're on the gear, when you go off the gear, you don't go right down to baseline. You go way below baseline. So now you're sending, before you had this signal saying, build lots of muscle, the signal that gets sent when that hormone level, when those hormones are gone and your body's not producing mm. its own hormones is not just, hey, let's go back to normal. It's we're going to go below normal. So you have to make it through that period. And what post-cycle therapy aims to do is to minimize or shorten uh, that period. And that they do that with certain yeah. drugs and you know, certain drugs that help boost natural testosterone and all that stuff. But the problem is when you go off those drugs, you still encounter a period of withdrawal where your body it gotta, has to kick up its own its own hormone. Well, levels. This is what's kept mm -hmm. me from even getting back on my my TRT. Is I've been I've been fighting now. I'm coming up close to two years. November will be or October will be two years for me. And and the only reason why I haven't is because the the fear of what that could feel like if I if I want to go off again. And so sucked. It does. It, it's it was the the only thing that was more miserable was uh, the Vicodin withdrawal. So Vicodin withdrawals is by far the worst. Yeah, but it's a, it was a shorter yes. period. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. The Vicodin withdrawals was like a, a hard month of my life, like mm. a really, really hard month of my life. The steroid withdrawal feeling, oh my God. I mean, I was only four years. And you did, and, and I want the, under, the, the listeners to understand, Adam did everything right. Right. He didn't just go off. This time I did. Yeah, yeah. You did the post cycle therapy properly. He weaned before that. You weaned yourself down to lower and lower doses, as recommended by hormone specialists. Mm -hmm. You took uh, testosterone boosting herbs afterwards. You were doing red light therapy and sauna, and you were lifting weights, and you were doing everything properly. Still fucking sucked. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. It's it's. There's definitely an addictive and and two the thing that you you get addicted to the the psychological part too. Oh, huge! I mean, when you when you you start lifting and you're lifting weights you've never lifted before, and you're getting these massive I feel like a monster. Yeah, the massive pumps. I mean, I just I feel like I'm peacocking everywhere. Yeah. I, all of a sudden, I I feel like I'm walking around my chest, and that mm. feels fucking good. It feels sure. amazing. And then when you come all the way off, like you said, you don't just kind of go back to like normal happy version of you. You go back to this kind of deflated version of you, and that kind of messes with you psychologically. So, yeah, it's not. Uh, it's uh, I don't know. There's. I definitely. I, I wish I would have. I wish I would have talked to different people before I ever messed with it in my early twenties. And I wish I would have known better. I wish I would have done things a lot differently. 
Um, I mean, I definitely am somebody too who to each their own. I think there's a, a very large chance that I eventually will get back on uh, hormone replacement therapy because I've been I've been doing everything in my will for the last year and a half to try and get myself over this like 300 free test score and I'm having a really hard time getting beyond that. I've got back to normal. I can actually, I, you know, impregnated my girl. So my shit's working, you know, that was my number one priority for me. And so I'm happy about that, but I still, I still miss that, that desire. And and part of that, you know, so the, the audience kind of understands the motivation of the swimming and the rowing. Um, I've, I've lost a lot of the motivation to, to train hard. I know what I feel like when I'm, I have good high testosterone levels. It's, and I'm nowhere near that feeling. And so instead of me dwelling on that, being depressed about it and letting it beat me up about it, I've shifted my, my mindset. I've just said, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to let that beat me up and be like, oh, I'm not squatting 400 pounds anymore. And, and being, being depressed about it or potentially trying to push myself to that point and injuring myself. I just, I've let go of like, oh, I, I want to be this monster. I'm just going to do other things that promote health, make me feel good. And that's the yeah. swimming and the rowing and mobility and all this other yeah, the stuff. Pro- the problem with this question is I can answer it theoretically, but then I can also answer it realistically. Now, theoretically, if you go on and off anabolic steroids and you do good post-cycle therapy and your body does a good job rebounding and you do this for a long enough period of time, Will you end up with more muscle later on than if you never did that? Probably. I think so. You probably would. Now, realistically, I don't know many people that did this and then didn't have to go on uh, hormone replacement therapy afterwards. I don't. I just don't know a lot of guys who did this on and off anabolics and then hit their 30s and 40s and then never did them again and continue working out. These are the two types of people that I've, I've encountered who did this. The ones who go off... And then just stop fucking lifting weights. They're just like, forget it. They don't want to lift at all anymore. Or the people who go off and then eventually get back on and do uh, hormone replacement therapy and keep lifting. In which case, I can't necessarily use them as an example of, okay, did they gain permanent muscle? Plus, lifting weights for a long period of time anyway builds uh, kind of a new baseline. I mean, I know myself now at the age of 40... I can keep muscle way easier than I could when I was way, in, my, in my early 20s. Way easier. Yeah. Right now, I, I've mentioned that I'm doing way more le- or way less volume than I ever have in my life. Mm-hmm. I mean, and after one workout, I look I look better than what I did in my mid-20s, 20, like 23, 24. Pushing it. Yeah, pushing it and trying as hard as I could to grow and be bigger. I look better today like that with being off of everything. So I definitely think you will. To your point too, Sal, when someone asks me about potentially taking steroids, that's the advice that I give them if they're going to do it. I say I think you need to make peace with the fact that you may be doing it for the rest of your life. Now, if you're if you're someone who just oh I want to try it or get some gains from it and then I want to get off of it, like not saying that you can't do that, but like you said, I don't know too many people that have gone down that path. Yeah. And so I typically recommend someone if you're going to cross that line and you're going to do something like that. You should be mentally prepared that hey, this may be something that I'm okay doing for the rest of my life. And if that's and you're and hey, if you're somebody who's okay with that, mm-hmm. then, then to each their own. And to think to say that there are no potential long term side effects of always having high testosterone, to the, where you're you're supplementing and you're getting your levels to the highest level all the time that your body's not naturally producing, to say that there's no side effects with that is fucking asinine. Get out of here. Now, are, how bad are the side effects? depends on the person It'll you're vary, talking right? yeah. depends i mean it does thicken your blood in many cases uh you, you do see oftentimes with people who've been on them for a long period of time heart issues and kidney issues um so there can be long-term effects if you have let's say you have uh, prostate issues or other issues related to androgen levels could that exacerbate them make them worse yes and here's the other thing too Let's say you have naturally high testosterone levels. Is it different than when you're supplementing and getting your testosterone levels high? Yes, Mm -hmm. because in order for you to have high natural testosterone levels, it means other things are dialed in. It means that you're getting good sleep, you're getting good training. When you're taking doses of testosterone from outside your body, putting it in your body, you have high testosterone. It masks a lot of things. In in spite of, right? right? So now I'm not getting good sleep, still have high testosterone. My diet's not good, still have high testosterone. In the context of an unhealthy, unbalanced life, in my opinion, high testosterone can become a problem because I think the body adjusts its hormone levels based on your lifestyle yeah. partially to protect you 
it also yeah, those natural checks and balances are there for a reason. All, you know, all the rest of your hormones have to work together harmoniously for you to have the best optimal health. And to introduce, you know, an exogenous hormone, you know, there's a risk factor to that. Yeah, yeah. And and, and your body's intelligent. You're, you're, the human body's intelligent, and it kind of balances itself out. And it, so it also fools you into thinking that you got good programming and good diet. You don't totally. learn anything about programming, right? right I mean, because you get away with a lot. You mm. see and that it. that may be a main contributor too to what you know. If you're trying to like go through it naturally after that, and you didn't learn all the steps it took to really peak, uh, you know, good luck. That was the biggest mistake I made. That if I could go back, if I was still going to take steroids but still do it in a different way, the number one thing that I would do differently was I wouldn't have fell fell for my own bullshit, which was. Oh, the the thing that separates me from all the guys on the cover of the magazine is they're all taking steroids or taking more. Right, or right, and so I assume that w- instead of probably humbling myself and going, well, maybe I'm just not that good at programming. Maybe I don't have my diet as dialed as I think it needs to be. Because later on, I learned that that was that was the key. That was the magic yeah. of what got me to be this professional men's physique athlete. Was I was I had learned what I needed to learn about programming. I'd learned what I needed to learn about diet. That changed my body more than anything did. Piling on the steroids on top of that obviously took me to the professional level and made me look at like a monster, but I would have never got there had I not done the other things first. And what you see in the gym, you'd be surprised how many people are walking around the gym right now that are on steroids. And There's look like garbage. Yeah, I would I would venture yeah. to say it's fifty percent. It's I would venture to say half the people in there either have or are, and you just don't even realize it and they mm-hmm. look terrible because they're not. They're missing the other major pieces. Yeah, and you get the testosterone zealots who will pull up studies and they'll say, "Look, men with higher testosterone levels uh, live longer, are healthier, have healthier hearts, have, of course, more muscle mass, better bone density, uh, are more mobile, better sex lives, they're happier." Yes, that's true. That is true when you look at studies. But then what they do, this is where they fuck up, is they say, "So therefore, supplementing with testosterone to keep my testosterone levels high." equates with these studies. No. Those studies are showing healthy men who are naturally producing that testosterone. Again, if you're a man and you're very healthy, you are going to have higher levels of testosterone. Which one, What part of that is making you healthier? Is it all the things you're doing that's giving you the higher testosterone or is it just the higher testosterone? Yeah. I'll, I'll say that it's probably everything. So simply giving yourself injections and then saying, but I'm healthy because the study... Not true at all. You're masking a lot of things. And I know a lot of people like this. I know a lot of people who, I know guys in their 40s. These are guys that I, you know, I knew, you know, back in the day who now are on, uh, you know, taking hormone replacement and they constantly test their testosterone and they're keeping their levels at like 900 or 1,000. And they're like, yeah, but I, you know, I feel great, this and that. But I know, I'm like, you don't get good sleep. I know you party a lot. You don't have good diet. Your training's not good. You're totally masking all the other issues that are happening. And, and that can become a, a ticking time bomb. So, I mean, it sounds like an anti-steroid you know, commercial. I know. I, I, I wanted to finish it with but telling people because I know at one point I've already announced on this podcast that I'll, I'll start another cycle. In fact, I already have it. I have it ready, and I've had it ready for the last three months, and I just haven't taken it because I'm still I'm wanting to prolong it. There's other things that I'm trying to focus on. I, I actually kind of want to get closer to the two-year mark. Uh, before I even consider doing it again. So I don't want to sound like we're just fucking railing on it. Then all of a sudden everybody here is like six months later or whatever. <laughs> hey, Adam's on a cycle. What the yeah, fuck? You know what I'm saying? But I think it's the responsible yeah. thing for us to do, uh, you know, being the people that we are in the position that we're in is to, to because I wish someone would have said all this to me. Yeah. I wish I, I wish I would have had better trusted information shared with me before I made the leap into doing it and then go out and make your own decision because I, I think we all stand by that that you know to each their own it is your body but these are just all the things that you want to take into consideration before you make that dive yeah, be educated next question is from prime and glory during your last visit to red dot fitness regarding sales what piece of information provided the greatest impact to the audience? Oh, that's a cool question. Yeah, so that was fun. We're going to do another one, actually. I think, uh, Doug, this airs tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> Correct. So right when this is airing, um, I will be I will have just finished another one of these sales training. This time I'm doing one at a 24-hour fitness uh, location, which is kind of interesting, a little full circle. Uh, you know, it's where I started my career. You know, the thing I think that blew the trainers away the most uh, was when I kind of communicated this information right here. You know, when you're when you're talking to somebody about fitness, this isn't the first time they've considered or tried getting themselves uh, fit and healthy. Most of the time when you talk to somebody, especially if you're a trainer, 
and you're talking to them about potentially hiring a trainer to work out with them and teach them how to do everything properly, they have attempted and tried several times, or they've thought about it for a long time. They're coming to you now as this. You're not the first thing. They're not the first decision that they made. And the, most of the time, what stops them in the past from continuing or even from starting are objections that they create themselves, things that they place in front of themselves, obstacles that they create. So it's things like, I don't have time. I don't enjoy it. I, I don't have support. I don't know if this is something I want to do. I think these other things are more important. Money. Whatever. Money, whatever. They are creating their own obstacles. And so the thing that I taught the trainers was, rather than waiting for those obstacles to reveal themselves, over help the person overcome their own obstacles by asking the right questions. So this happens in the beginning. So for example, if I'm talking to a potential client and I know that one of the objections that I tend to get from people is, I don't know uh, if I'm really committed to this. Like, Because let's say I do my whole presentation, hey, do you want to hire me? It's going to cost you, you know, $500 or whatever. And the person's going to say, oh, I don't know if I'm that serious. Very difficult at that point. This is an excuse that they've used many times to themselves to stop themselves. But if I went back in time and I asked them the simple question, on a scale of 1 to 10, how serious are you about achieving the goals that you just gave me? A 1 meaning you really don't care and a 10 meaning you just want to get started. doesn't mean you're going to work out every day, but it means you're very serious about these goals and this is something you want to work towards. Most of the time, the person is going to give you an 8, 9, or a 10, a very serious. They're going to say, no, no, I'm very, very serious. And you can talk about that for a second. Now when I get, now if we fast forward, and it's the part now where I'm presenting my training, the odds that that person is going to give me the, I don't know if this is something I'm really serious about objection, is far lower because they had themselves have overcome their own obstacle earlier in the conversation. And this is kind of how I presented how you communicate to clients. I, you know, I don't have much to add to that because it's exactly what I was going to say. Um, I remember when you were writing uh, the outline for this and mm-hmm. you came you came out of the room when we were at the the house that we were just recently at. And you said, hey, man, I'm trying to remember all the all the questions and you were reading them off to me. And it like kind of took me down a, a down a trip down memory, memory lane. And something that, uh, you know, and we do, we, I think we uh, attribute a lot of our education with sales and in business to 24 hour fitness. And one of the things that they were just masterful at was training trainers on how to be uh, great at sales. And one of the, probably the biggest keys was what Sal was teaching, which was these, I think it's about 10 or 15 questions, yeah. right? about 10 or 15 questions that 24 hour fitness at this time had already figured out for us, which was great. We just come and one of the things that I saw my peers not doing well was using this. In fact, I'll never forget getting into management. And when I first had to, to teach trainers this stuff and I would teach them and then I would get, I would go around the corner to kind of like listen in on their conversation. And some of my trainers would would take this this sheet that the clients would fill out with all these questions. What are, like Sal says, what are your goals? Mm-hmm. How committed are you? Does your spouse support you? All these questions, right? And I would see trainers push it over on a clipboard and have the client fill it out. And I was like, "Oh shit!" Like they don't fucking get it. They don't realize yeah. what they those don't. Are they for. don't. They don't realize yeah. why, why, why you're or how you're supposed to use these. Right. And so I think the the, the valuable piece because I I think a lot of big companies by now. So if you work for a Lifetime Fitness or a Twenty Four Hour Fitness or you know probably even a Planet LA Fitness, Fitness L, yeah, or... any of these big gyms, I would assume have some sort of a structure around this. Maybe it's now digital and it's on the computer, mm-hmm. which probably makes it even worse because it's less personal with somebody. But that's a huge mistake if you're a trainer, if you just kind of breeze through these and you think of it more like if you're treating it like a par Q, or yeah. that, that's not what it's there for. It's not like a medical thing where you have someone fill it out and it's just like, oh, you need, right. now I know these things. You're supposed to use these questions to pull out all the objections that someone would normally give you when the money comes out. Right. So that part, I think people were just mind blown when Sal was like ask these questions. This is why you ask these questions. This is what you're trying to fish out. So then when you present the price, you don't even have to overcome the objection because they already did it for you. Mm -hmm. Well, and that was the other thing too, because it's like, well, what about these other objections? What this objection? What is, what are all those objections amount to? It's the money. Mm -hmm. And so like your, your case, you're building with this person and the value and the trust and everything else, you should have 
already have been able to establish all of that and drawn it up well enough to where they're like, okay, well, what are we talking here? How can we make this work? As opposed to like, well, I can't, I can't commit because of, so, you know, they're, they're looking for some kind of an out at that point. Yeah. At the end of the day, remember what you're trying to do, right? You're here, you are your trainer. And first off, you, you, hopefully you have a lot of integrity and you're a trainer because you're passionate about, about fitness. So hopefully that's the case. And in fact, if you're not that kind of a trainer, quit your job and do something else. I, I fucking hate trainers that don't have integrity and who don't do fit or aren't in fitness for uh, the, you know for passion because they actually believe in what they're doing. But let's say you are one of those trainers, you have integrity and you're passionate about fitness. You know the value that fitness can bring to someone's life. Let's think about that for a second. What kind of value does an active, healthy lifestyle bring to anybody? I don't care what this person does for work, who they are, if they're a parent, if they're single, if they're in a relationship, if they work a lot they of hours. If they have a lot of money, if they don't have a lot of it money. It doesn't matter. It improves every aspect of your life. It is literally self-improvement. It's the core of self-improvement. So you know this as a trainer, and you know what it takes to get uh, active. You know what it takes in terms of exercise technique and programming. You know it's not just haphazard. So you know all this stuff. But and you're, now your job is to convince this person who has no clue sitting on the other side of the desk of you. They have no idea. They don't know any of this stuff. All they know is, I want to lose 20 pounds. I want to look better. I've tried this five times before. I've been overweight on and off for the last 10 years. I haven't been active at all. Your job is going to be, how can I convince them that I hold the truth? You literally hold the truth in your hands. How can you get them to understand you? The only way you can do it, and now maybe in the future I'll be able to connect my brain to someone else's brain and just download some shit and it won't even be a, a sales presentation. They'll be like, oh, fuck, I know now. Done. Here's a thousand bucks. Not going to happen. You have to use words and you have to help them reveal to themselves why this is going to be one of the best investments that they made. This is the same person that, you know, maybe drives a ten or twenty, thirty thousand dollar car, maybe spends a hundred, two hundred dollars on Starbucks coffee every day. You're about to present something. <laughs> every day, I'm sorry, every every month. <laughs> my bad. A serious that's a lot, problem. That's Justin. <laughs> a lot of frappuccinos. <laughs> yeah, that's my bad. Uh, somebody who spends that much money on on coffee or snacks or whatever, and here you are presenting something that's far more valuable than all those things combined. The, it's and with way less expensive in terms of the the value you're going to get for it. You need to be able to communicate that to them effectively, and you need them to reveal it to themselves. That, I think, was the part that everybody was like, oh, shit, that makes perfect sense. I totally get it because I think a lot of trainers are so afraid of the word sales Yeah, because it invokes the image of the sleazy salesperson or the manipulative person or the person who's like, let me ask my manager. Let me see if I can get a price for you. Great, awesome. Like, I, I get all that. No, 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 no. You're fucking doing good work. Mm -hmm. You're an evangelist for fitness. Mm -hmm. Your job is to get them to understand the true value in what you do. And the only way you can do that is if you can get them to reveal it to themselves because you won't be able to force it happening. I promise. In fact, if you push it, their walls are going to go up higher and higher. And this higher. is why I used to take every single walk that I did. Every single person that I did not buy, I used to take it so personal because it always does come down oh, to- Oh, you got to explain what a walk is. Yeah. 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah someone yeah. walking out and not buying, right? right? So I took, I used to get pissed every fucking time, no matter the excuse, no matter what, because yep. to me, it is always comes down to value and price. And my job is to provide so much value that it just, the price doesn't even fucking matter at that point. Mm -hmm. And if they walk, then I didn't do that. I did not provide enough value for them to see that this, yeah. the number doesn't even matter. And that's when you when you know you've gotten really good at it is when you can get people bought and committed to doing it and the number hasn't even came out yet. Yeah, they're like, oh no, yeah. for sure I'm going to do this. Right, right. And now it's just a matter of, all right, let's see what works in your budget. Right, and exactly. Mm -hmm. Are we buying the whole program for the next six months or am I starting you off with just one of our five packs or our ten packs? That I'm seeking that out. I'm seeking out getting commitment from you that you for sure want to do this before we even talked price. And, to, and it's a process that requires attention and reps. Mm -hmm. and, and you have, like, if, it doesn't matter if you work for a gym or if you work, you know, for yourself. Like, you have to treat it as part of what you do. Like, this is what I do. I have to convince them that they need to work with me. You, you and need, that's part of the process. You need to master how to communicate uh, if you're going to ever be a successful trainer. And, and success is defined by clients who are getting fit, who are getting good results, who are maintaining and developing lifestyle of fitness, 
You have to be a good communicator. And you don't want to know what's really telling about all this? I'll tell you what's – this is what's extremely telling is that trainers oftentimes are afraid to ask for money because they themselves don't see the, the value in what they're doing, partially because they take it for granted. To them, fitness might have come easy. To them, they don't see the true value. In it. And a lot of trainers are afraid. Like, oh, I don't want to present – $1,500 worth of training or $3,000 worth of training. And I used to hear trainers do this and I'd take them aside and be like, hold on a second. Let's stop. If you're trying to talk about a $3,000 package of training, let's be honest here. If the person does what you tell them and you train them and they show up to the workouts and you do a good job, what are they going to get for those $3,000? And we'll sit there and list all the stuff. I'm like, is that worth three grand? How much is it really worth? And there's no price tag. It's 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 priceless. It's worth far more than the, than the pack. And all of a sudden the trainer's like, okay, I'm not afraid now to ask for the money, but it is very telling. You know, don't take it for granted. Next question is from Lucas Hunt 10. What's one thing you firmly believe to be true that everyone disagrees with you on? <laughs> so, yeah. Do conspiracy theories? Oh my God, yeah, yeah, this has to be. I'm right? going to have to go last. I got to rack uh, my brain on this. It can't be just like fitness and health related. It has yeah. to be like something out there. Well, right? it's got to be anything, right? Because yeah, I, I, I definitely don't even have a fitness thing that I think that everyone disagrees with me on. Yeah, that's, well, that most people, I guess. I'm, well, sure most people. I'm sure there's going to be people that agree with you on whatever you say, right? Yeah, yeah. right. That's kind of hard. That's a hard one. I can't start on this one. This is. Yeah. I need to rack my brain a little I, bit. I know, I, we've talked about this a little bit before, but it's like, I mean, the, <laughs> Justin <laughs> believes it's embarrassing. The, Justin believes Earth's flat. Yeah. <laughs> you guys don't? No. Shut up. No. Stop before you fucking. No, I don't. I don't <laughs> okay, fucking good. Believe the Earth's flat. <laughs> Come on, dude. Like that, that, that to me is baffling that people have bought into that and that's res- resurged. But, uh, yeah, for me, uh, I mean, it's not that much, you know, crazier, I guess I believe in spirits. How about that? Okay. okay. <laughs> ghost. So this ghost spirit, whatever you want to talk, you know, give them a, a label. Uh, have I don't really know one? what it is. You ever seen one or experienced like a ghost or spirit? Yeah. Yeah. I have, and it, it and it's not necessarily a visual thing as much as like I was trying to think. It was maybe it's, you know, a bunch of weird occurrences all at once, like in a a certain um, you know energy, whatever. Um, but yeah, I told that story like when we first started the podcast. Tell it again, dude. I dude. gotta hear the story again. <laughs> so my friend and I were at this. It was, well. My one of my other friends, like they got an apartment that was like basically at the top of what used to be an old, um, like play school, and so like it was like an abandoned. I know, creepy already. Wait, so it, the whole, the bottom part's abandoned? Uh, yeah, yeah. So nobody uses it anymore. There's still like, um, you know, like play doh and, and crayons and like all this stuff that like for crafts and all this like left there. So it was like it used to be like an old little school like for like a you know for for young kids. And he lived upstairs. And he lived upstairs because <laughs> the, the the owner had that space available and it was like the rent was super cheap or whatever. So we wanted to use it as like a place to jam and and play music and stuff. And so my friend and I were in there and my other friend was upstairs playing video games and you know smoking weed and all that. And so uh, we were downstairs playing music and singing the song and trying to like, you know, get, get this jam going between the two of us. And, uh, like he wrote these lyrics. We just been really into this franchise, evil dead. You guys know that like the army of darkness, oh, evil yeah, dead, yeah, yeah, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Okay. So like the song was like bass. It was like the chorus line of it was evil dead in my head, evil dead in my, and like, we just kept repeating that. Right. And uh, so we're playing it, and it's like this punk kind of vibe, you know, in this song and everything. We're kind of jamming it out. And uh, I stop, and I was like, I kind of heard some weird, like, noises you know, from behind me. And uh, it seemed to be coming out of the amp. And I'm like, all right, I'm tripping out, dude. Because I had, I, <laughs> I mean, full disclosure, like, I totally had smoked before this. So I, I, so I had <laughs> yeah. four hits of acid. So, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Maybe there was something in that, but, like, I know how I am when I'm, like, I've had some, you know, uh, some, some, you know, cannabis. And I know, like, like I'm not, like, losing sense of reality or anything, <laughs> you know. But uh, I definitely was, like, you know, aware of what my surroundings and what was going on. And so this voice, like, kept getting a little bit louder and, like, a little bit louder. And then I, I completely stop. And then, and then my friend Joe, he looks back at me and he stops playing. So now it's quiet. Quiet, but it kept singing. It, and it was this little kid voice. And it's like, evil dead in my head, evil. And it kept singing. 
And then I was like, I fucking looked at him, freaked out. I went and I grabbed, unplugged the amp. And then it, it like started to go away and it was like fading out with the amp. And then it stopped and we just froze and we're just like, nobody's going to fucking believe. It. And we told my friend upstairs and he's like, oh man, you guys are tripping out, man. Yeah. He was like super high. And uh, so he totally didn't believe us, you know, like, I'm like, whatever, that's fine. So that doesn't end there. Like that, that's oh, not more. the end of the story. Um, I drove back and I was just like really not like that freaked me out. Like I was like, this isn't cool. Like I, I, you know, I've heard stories of people seeing ghosts and this and that and the other. And I was, was it like, like I little, just didn't want to believe it. Was it a little kid's voice? Yeah. Oh, that's even fucking creepy. Right. Exactly. So it was like a horror movie, you know? And like, I was like, I don't want to do that. Like, I'm not going to sing that song again. None of this stuff. Like, I'm not going to mess with Ouija boards, you know? Like, that's why, like, I, I kind of freak out when people like talk about that stuff. And my friend, like, we were at my other, my other friend's house and we're, he was like playing that song again by himself in like in this room. And I was in the other room and all of a sudden he stops and like the, the doors for the closet, like bust open and like shit just flew out. And he just, he like, he stopped and he looked at me and I, like, I, I was like looking around the corner and then he told me what just happened. Cause I, I heard all this rustling. I was like, what the fuck was that? And he told me, like, crazy stuff just happened again. I sing that same song. <laughs> and I was like, stop singing that song. <laughs> That's horrible. You know what I get out of this? That's a fucking hit song, bro. It is. Yeah, it's <laughs> ready for marketing. You have your guitar and your amp here. You have You're your, right, dude. You have your guitar Don't and your amp Don't play that bro. shit in here. I'm going to play it. You guys <laughs> Please, watch what happens. Please play it. I'll record you. It'll be viral if some shit goes oh, down. Oh, my God. So, anyways, like, that's... <laughs> That's just one incident. I've had a few where I've been a little bit sensitive to, uh, you know, the sort of spirit stuff. And so I've, I've really tried to stay away from it, to be honest. Maybe the spirits are following you. Maybe. Yeah, Maybe. that's kind of crazy. Uh, for me, I'll tell you what I kind of believe that a lot of people disagree with me on. I think the two major political parties of this country work together behind the scenes to give us the false illusion of choice. That's what I think. I think that they fucking kill each other and rip each other and attack each other, forcing us to pick the lesser of two evils. But when all is said and done, they have the same sponsors, they have the same people that work with them and work for them, and that it doesn't make a huge difference, uh, you know, who's doing what. It's all kind of part of this game. And the reason why I believe this is because anytime a, a third party comes out or independent or whatever, they, they both work, they work together to fucking squash them every single time. And also the, the 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 shit that they the narratives I can start to see the narratives are kind of the same for each one like oh okay I know who we're gonna go to war with next looks like we're starting up the narrative there and I can see what they're trying to and so I feel like they're they you know what do you how do you control a free society hmm. you have to give you have to give them the option or the illusion that they're picking their own destiny mm -hmm. when in reality you're picking it for them and it's funny because marketers have known this for a long time you know back and i talked about same this a long time tricks ago. oh ba back in the day so back in the 80s so all you old people listening right now <laughs> you'll remember the uh the cola wars they called them this was when pepsi and coke were running commercials about which you know which soda which cola was better and they would have all these like you know, these commercials where they, they would call it the Pepsi Challenge or Take the Coke Challenge. Right, right. People would drink them and they'd they say- were, they were both in cahoot, cahoots together. People don't know that. Yeah. That behind the scenes, Coke and Pepsi yeah. agreed to do this and run these commercials. And what ended up happening is Coke and Pepsi took a larger share of the soda market. They took shares from, you know, Fanta and, you know, other, you know, soda manufacturers. Because what happens is when you create this battle- um, all, that, the little, all the little guys get crushed. Yeah, musicians know this. Yeah. You know, East Coast, West Coast, fucking our band's better than yours, these beefs or whatever. Oftentimes, they do that because then you forget about everyone else and you feel like you have to be on a side. And I think that the political parties have known this for a, for a long fucking time. And in reality, behind closed doors, you know, when no one's looking, they're giving each other hand jobs and high fives and we're all over here thinking that we're, we're, oh, fuck that guy. I'm a fucking Democrat. I'm a Republican. Yeah, it seems obvious to me. But yeah, I could see how people would like not want to believe that. That's what I think. Yeah. Well, maybe the reason why we're all together <laughs> is because I agree with both of you. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm with Justin. I've had some crazy uh, spiritual experiences in my life uh, that I can't explain. 
I don't try to explain. I don't yeah. even talk about. Uh, but I, 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 I didn't I, want to talk about right, that. Right, but but I believe it. Um, so what do you I, mean? I want to hear one of them. Yeah, no, I just we've had weird shit, just like Justin. Where you hear shit, you know, you you hear shit or you see stuff. Like it's just, I've had stuff like that happen with me. Um, and I, you know, I attribute a lot of that to growing up in this very, the spiritual type of home. I mean, my my family at one point was going to like you know, Pentecostal type of churches where there's like speaking in tongues and slain in the spirit. And like, you know, my mom was fucking rebuking the devil out of the house and like crazy. This is where they pass yeah. around snakes and shit. And they're like, uh, not quite like that, but, it's like but spiritual I, warfare. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Spiritual warfare stuff. And so, you know, I don't know how much of that was, uh, you know, created in my own head because I grew up in a house like that. I'm, I'm open to that argument, but there's enough shit for me to have felt it and believed it myself. So I can totally get on board with Justin. I a hundred percent believe with you, Sal, like, that's part of the reason why I'm not a voter. I mean, people give me shit all the time about not voting, and I'm just in, in my eyes, I feel like it's sometimes a waste. And I know that ruffles some people's feathers, and they get all pissed off because they hear you say that. But that's the kind of the reason why I believe that. I just believe that we're they. It's already decided in a sense, you know. It's like right. it's or how dare you vote for that third party? It's like, but they were the most reasonable, right? Wouldn't you want to put your vote in somebody you actually like want in office? Like, doesn't that? Why does that not make sense? Right. So yeah. I guess the thing that maybe I I believe that maybe a lot of people maybe disagree. So because I do believe in a a, a higher power, right? I do believe that there's a God. I believe that. I believe that everything that we are doing and we've done, we were destined to do. Um, I believe everything that's happened in my life, there was there was purpose and reason behind it. I, I when it so, and whether that be that's the faith that's got me through that, that's had that's made me grow through all those challenges. That's kind of how why those things don't affect me like it affects the average person. Like anytime something happens in my life, I automatically I resort to kind of looking up, looking up and going like, okay, what am I supposed to learn here? What are you telling me right now? Mm -hmm. And I and I, I truly believe that. I believe that I every even the worst of worst things that have happened in my life, I believe they were a gift as a lesson for me. And as as painful as sometimes those lessons are, I, I believe that it, it was a gift to me and that I have to learn to look at it that way. And I've I've trained myself to do that. And every and the the more and that's not to say that I haven't struggled with that. I've struggled with that as a young kid and a teenager and a young man and then into adulthood of you know these hardships and these challenges that have happened and going like up and I have those moments for sure where I say poor me or what the fuck or this can if there was a god then why would he ever do something so evil or bad and when I once I pull myself out of that feeling and I go okay there there's a there's a there's a, a lesson in this for me there's something that I'm supposed to get from this and that I'm supposed to grow from and when, as soon as I can switch my mindset to that and start seeking out what that is, I'm always rewarded. And anybody that has read the Bible and is in that knows that that's it's in there. It speaks of that, and so you know. I, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that are atheists and don't believe and would. You yeah, know. but you know what the irony of that is is that whether you're atheist or religious or spiritual, you should believe that because here's why. Let's say Adam's wrong. Let's say there is no higher power and there is no destiny. Um, will you benefit from viewing all of your challenges as learning lessons? Yes. No matter what, it doesn't matter if there's a God or not. The end result is shit's going to happen to you because it does to everybody. And you can choose to either believe that you're going to learn from it and grow from it and that look at it as a gift, or you can view it as this terrible fucking coincidence that happened to me or this terrible circumstance. Either Both of those produce different mindsets and either of those and either of those will put you in a different direction. And so it really doesn't matter in my opinion. It doesn't matter. Even back when I was atheist, I believed that because I thought to myself like regardless if I view this challenge as uh, and this this problem as a gift to grow from, then that's what's going to happen. I'm going to get something out of it. What you know, I I never let a fucking terrible thing go to waste in the sense that if something terrible happens to you, Get something positive out of it, even if it's just a change of mindset. That's right. that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. right, so, right. but anyway, back you know back to the the you know the, the political thing. I do think it's I, I, the the thing I do want to communicate is this. You know, if you if you get kind of nihilistic, thinking like ah oh, fuck, you know, the both political parties working together, whatever. Remember this: the most powerful vote that you have, period, end of story, is where you place your money. So anytime you buy something or you don't buy something. You are making a, you are placing a vote with your dollar, and this is where the power lies. 
with the world, especially in America, is that politicians can say and do whatever, but we decide what ends up happening by where we throw our money. And if you look at the market, that's exactly what it reflects. So the stuff that you don't like in the market and you get angry with it and you're like, why are we selling so much alcohol? Why are we selling this bullshit? That's a reflection of society. We decide what gets sold and what doesn't. They can try forcing us all they want. Of course, it could turn into something tyrannical and terrible. But at the end of the day, man, we, you make decisions every single day. That's where your real power lies. Um, and with that, look, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. They're all free and they're all awesome. You can also find us all on Instagram. Uh, we have our own personal pages. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find my page at Mind Pump Sal. And Adam, you can find him at Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.